Welcome everyone. The Authors Guild and the Authors Guild Foundation are so happy you could join us today for an exciting talk in our series, Business Boot Camps for Writers. Today we're doing our popular format from manuscript to marketplace, where we do book talks for an audience of fellow writers. Joining us is author Allison Gilbert, uh, whose most recent book is Listen World, a biography of newspaper columnist Elsie Robinson, Allison's agent, uh, Richard Morris of Janklow and Nesbitt, and Emma Berry, senior editor at Basic Books. Uh, so Business Boot Camps for Writers is made free and public thanks to support from the National Endowment for the Arts and from Penguin Random House. So thank you to them and to all our donors. Uh, everyone, you can visit the resources section at authorsguild.org and find recordings of past events. Uh, we've covered finding an agent, doing your own marketing, uh, personal finance tips for freelancers, and other things that writers should know about the business side of being an author. Um, but now for a little proper introduction, Allison Gilbert is the author of several works on loss and grief, including Always Too Soon, Parentless Parents, Past and Present. She's also a journalist, and she's extensively chronicled the events of September 11th. Uh, now, as the co-author of Listen World, she shifted gears a bit to write a biography, and we're very excited to hear more about that. Um, her editor, Emma Berry, is at Basic Books and Seal Press, where she acquires a broad range of research-based nonfiction. And her agent, Richard Morris, has been with Janklow and Nesbitt Associates since 1998, um, representing narrative nonfiction and literary fiction. So Emma, Richard, and Allison, thank you so much for being here. And uh, tell us all about Listen World. Thank you so much for having us, Johnny, and the Authors Guild and the Foundation. This is a huge honor. I don't take this invitation lightly. You have so many authors and fine, wonderful books to choose from. And it's exciting to share Team Elsie with you because that's what we've kind of called ourselves all along, the opportunity to resurrect this incredible woman's life has been a great honor for us. And I want to just tell you a little bit about Elsie Robinson first, and then uh, we'll go into a deeper conversation about how the book came to be. But the headline is that Elsie Robinson came from nothing and she became through her own incredible moxie, determination, and grit, the highest paid woman writer in the entire William Randolph Hearst media empire. The time frame is the 20s through the 50s. And she also became the most well-read woman writer columnist of her time. She had more than 20 million readers. And to just put that number into perspective, that's double the number today of current subscribers to the New York Times. So she had America's attention. And yet, and I'll start with Richard first, if you don't mind, Emma, uh, my agent's work was cut out for him because we've been very lucky by the newspaper book reviews of Listen World. And everyone basically had the same headline in reviewing this book, whether it was the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or uh, the Washington Post, we've been really lucky. And they all basically said, Elsie Robinson, who? <laughs> and to be honest, that was the problem that I think Richard, you feared all along in trying to sell this book. So I think maybe we should start with you, Richard, which is, I guess you were kind of nervous to take on this project-ish. I know you were infatuated as I was with Elsie, but what were some of the challenges that you faced taking on this idea that we had? Okay, so I think I'm gonna I'm gonna I'll start with the story, and, and, and I'm really happy to be here. And, and uh, Johnny, thanks for setting this up. And, and um, uh, I think maybe in, you know, and you can come in here, Allison, if I'm if I missed the story, because Allison and I have been working together for a long time, and uh, so I believe we were just sort of finishing up uh, your duties on the the last book, Past and Present, and. Um, and so you had called me and said you had this idea that was going to be a departure from what you had done in the past. And it was a biography of a woman named Elsie Robinson. And 
Um, and I think, as I remember, you said, all you need to do is, I know you've never heard of her. And I know you're <laughs> going to be slightly worried about me doing a biography, especially about a woman that no one's ever heard of. And, and I was. And you said, I just need you to read this book called I Want It Out, uh, which was a, a, a memoir that she wrote um, uh, back in 1934, I believe. And yeah. um, so honestly, when we hung up the phone, I knew you were going to send me the book. And I, I did. I paused and I thought. There is no way that Allison is going to do this project. Uh, you know, <laughs> never done a biography. I don't know who this person is. And, you know, just quickly to get to it, I got the book and I started reading it and I didn't put it down. Uh, the, the book uh, that Elsie wrote was as good as anything I was reading at the time. It was better, quite frankly. And, you know, we can talk more about that, why that is. But uh, the book stunned me. And I think I called you and, and I said, you know, Allison, I'm in. Yeah. That was the best call. That was the best day. And then, of course, the challenge of writing a proposal that would then, of course, um, perk the ears up of an editor of Emma's caliber, of the strength of the Hachette book group, of Basic Books, of Seal Press. That whole um, team needed to be impressed by her story to take a chance on it. And so I'm wondering if I can just pass it on to Emma, uh, the editor of this incredible um, project that I was so privileged to work on with you, Emma, what was your take of hearing Elsie's story? I know you weren't the acquiring editor. Uh, Laura Mazur was at that time still at Seal Press. So we can even talk about how that shifted internally at Seal Press too. But what when it landed with you and you had the wonderful task of taking on and making it better, what were your concerns? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, sort of like, as everyone mentioned, you know, as soon as I read Elsie's story, I was so taken with it. I was um, so in love with it. You know, I felt very lucky that it had landed on my desk, um, you know, but the challenge like, you know, was, and I think is always with biography and particularly I think with biography for people who have been, you know, unjustly forgotten, you know, is convincing the reader, you know, why out of all of the books that you can read in the bookstore, why would you pick up this one? Um, you know, and so I found my goal to be, you know, we need to convince readers um, to open this book in the first place, right? Like figure out how we're going to pitch this book, how we're going to package this book in a way that will make um, people pick it up and start reading because once they do, they're going to be in, um, you know, and so I, um, I, I viewed that as my, my task and, you know, Allison was, um, you know, had, as someone who had been sort of on the project for a long time, thinking about it for a long time, you know, and Richard as well, um, we're really a great team and in, um, in figuring out that pitch and then, you know, working on um, working on sort of making the manuscript sing, um, you know, to to really make sure that readers felt like they got what they what they came for. And I think they do. I think one of the things that I worked on really hard in the proposal was the why now question that Elsie Robinson died in 1956. She kept writing until the end. In fact, her column, Listen World, that's why we got the name for the book, Listen World, it was Elsie Robinson's column. It can even continued after she died because her editors at Hearst had so much in the hopper because she had already submitted the content. But one of the questions in a proposal is always, why now? She has been dead for so long. And what about the story needs to be told? And so I'm wondering for both of you, Richard, what do you think that hook was that was going to go and get a publisher, an editor to say yes? And then Emma, what about the story did in fact land for you in terms of like urgency and now? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think for this one, honestly, Allison, I'm not so sure that the why now was really all there for me. I oh. think because, I mean, you know, you talk about journalism, that's tough right now, right? But what what I centered on, I think, as we've talked about, you, I mean, 
you've got a woman here who broke convention, you know, in, in the start of the, in, in 1900, right? And, and she, she left her husband when that was not done with a child and with no money and, and went and worked in a gold mine in the yeah. West for four years. Um, and, you know, that alone, I think is, it was sort of, you know, perks your interest, but, but then, then the fact that she went on to become this incredible success story from that, you know, th that really, to me said that was urgent enough to say, we have a story here that needs to be told and, and needs to be, you know, um, understood and, and, uh, you know, to have people stand up and, and, and give her more acclaim. Hmm. Emma, what, I'm curious about your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the question of timeliness is always a double-edged sword, right? Because I think, you know, as we'll sort of get into um, the time from sort of conceiving of a nonfiction project to selling the book to writing the book to that book's publication is really, really long. Um, and so it can be hard to sort of know what the world is going to look like when the book publishes, right? And so you have to have a sense of timelessness. Um, and so, you know, Elsie's story, you know, as Richard mentioned, is just an incredible story. Um, you know, that said, you know, the, the mission of Seal Press um, is to advance feminism and, and to advance um, the stories of women, um, the stories of queer people. Um, and so one of the things um, that I thought made it a particularly good fit for SEAL um, is that there has been a lot of discussion sort of broadly in the last, you know, five or so years about who are the women in history that we've forgotten? You know, I think there's been a new, the big New York Times sort of obituaries um, project, you know, that this kind of plays into. Um, and so it felt like, you know, even if there wasn't sort of a very specific like current events hook or something like that, um, there is something in the zeitgeist um, that is making people very hungry for these kinds of stories. I also want to talk about platform. I think a lot of um, writers who have book projects burning in their bellies feel somewhat fearful that they're going to go to an agent or go to an editor and say, well, what's your platform? And I kind of want to nip that in the bud from my perspective. You guys might have a different point of view, but my social media platform is not huge. And yet I feel that I was able to take a part of my background, my professional history, my interests, what I've written about before, and use that as a different kind of platform. And I say that just to kind of bring more people into the conversation who feel they may not have a place. Because I feel like it's not just about social media numbers. And I wonder, Emma, if I could start with you. Do you feel when you're inside uh, those seal press boardrooms and you're looking at proposals coming through the transom is platform as important as we all writers fear it might be? Um, so the short answer is yes. Um, <laughs> the long, the, Don't the long, say that, Emma. No. Yeah. Um, the long answer, though, I think as you as you point out, Allison, is that you know I think a lot of writers have an incomplete idea of what we're thinking about when we're thinking about platform and we're thinking about acquiring books. You know, I think the question that I always want um, to be able to, um, you know, answer for my colleagues when they're sort when I'm sort of pitching to them, you know, hey, I want to buy this book and here's why um, is to be able to say, you know, this book, you know, in some ways could only be written by this person, right? Um, this person has, you know, think of platform as thinking about having the standing to write a book, right? Um, what makes this person out of all the authors, you know, in the world, and this is specifically for the kind of nonfiction that I do, right, sort of research-based, expert-driven um, nonfiction, um, you know, why this author for this project, um, you know, and I think that can be, you know, the author has a big social media following. Um, I think it's important that the social media following be relevant to the subject of the book. You know, I think if you're writing um, a book about, say, the Supreme Court, and your social media is all like your famous dog. That's great. That's cool. Uh, it shows that you can, you know, connect with an audience. 
but the people who are coming to your, to your dog Instagram aren't necessarily going to be coming to your Supreme Court book, right? And so I think that's part of it, um, you know, but also a lot of it is just having um, the background, right? And, you know, I think in some cases that means, you know, having perhaps an academic background in the subject, um, having, you know, many years in journalism on a particular beat, um, having been, you know, having done the research, I think with Elsie, for example, this is a great, um, this is a great example, um, you know, so that we can go to, um, to media, to readers to say, you know, here is this person and here is why you should be excited about them. Um, right. because I do think that it is increasingly important to sell, to sell authors in addition to books, um, or to sell authors in order to sell books. Wow. Well, yeah, I hope that land. I was just going to say, Richard, before you go, I yeah. hope that lands and people are hearing that and feeling a sigh of relief that it's not just numbers, that it goes to your street cred in a certain field or your personal experience. I feel like that's actually more of a welcoming position than feeling that it's just in metrics. What do you think, Richard? Well, I was just saying, I mean, if, if uh, you know, as I was saying, if you have, you know, 2 million followers on your, on your Instagram about dogs, I'm probably going to pitch the dog book to Emma. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to shift gears a little bit to um, structure. And if you think that makes um, a difference in how a book is marketed, and let me just kind of tell you where my thinking is. I think that the structure that Julia Shears, my amazing co-author and I developed was actually different than what we had in the proposal. Um, in the proposal, it certainly wasn't going to be a birth to death academic tome. That was never the tone of our book, but the end, the structure that we came down to for List and World is quite unique for biography where we almost make Elsie Robinson a third author. And what I mean by that is Elsie Robinson was a prolific writer. She wrote about 9,000 columns and articles throughout her career. There was an embarrassment of riches about how many of her words and quotes and sayings and mantras that we could use throughout the narrative to then inform her story, but also expand her voice in the story. So it doesn't read like a typical biography. And I'm wondering, do you think that helps market a biography, Emma, in terms of what Seal Press can do in terms of getting it in front of the media, um, in terms of getting the sales reps to be excited? Um, did it make a difference? That's a good question. I mean, I think that the over the quality of the read absolutely makes a difference. And I think that the way that you wove Elsie's words into it, certainly, I mean, it certainly resonated with reviewers. Um, but I consider that sort of part of the um, part of the overall read, right? I think just incorporating those words, um, had it not been done as elegantly as, as, as you and Julia were able to do, you know, wouldn't, um, wouldn't have made a difference. Um, it was really all in the framing. Um, and so I think that's really, that's really important, um, you know, but certainly having such a, having a subject who, you know, can, can speak for herself in many ways and is, um, it's just such a sort of, you know, firecracker on the page really, really matters. How is biography doing Richard these days in terms of um, your agency, Janglo and Nesbitt or nonfiction as opposed to fiction? What is the um, temperature these days among editors from your vantage point when you're selling other projects? Well, I, I, um, biography is always a little more challenging, right? Because you know that your your audience is going to be narrower. I mean, you know, with general nonfiction, you can pick up you know a, a broader audience. So there are some challenges in biography. I mean, it doesn't mean that you know, obviously we we still do them. I mean, um, and but. You know, and also you do find authors that that actually are kind of only biographers, right? Who who just are really good at that. You know, they're very good researchers, and they really, you know, I mean, obviously we represent like a Robert Caro here, who's written you know numerous books on Lyndon Johnson, and uh, 
you know, um, you know, I, I don't want to speak for Robert, but I, I think that he, he, he finds a lot of material for for um, for Lyndon. So there's a lot to write on. You know, David McCullough also a client, uh, you know, wrote extensively on you know American history and, and great American things, and and you know, so I would say that biography is always a little tougher, but um, and and nonfiction right now is is easier to sell than fiction. I'm, I'm sure that's not uh, news. Um, um, but I would say, and you know, so I, I, I know for the audience that might be, I, I don't know if that's, I, I don't want to discourage anyone from it. I think nonfiction, because of probably the landscape, as Emma talked about, just in terms of how we can uh, get attention for books, you know, we can get nonfiction writers can get on television and talk about, you know, a subject matter or it gets into the news some way, as you said, why now with fiction, you know, those, those uh, criteria can be tougher you're relying on you know, reviews, which are, you know, thinning out and, and also awards uh, and things like that, which maybe don't get the attention they used to. So I would say that, you know, nonfiction is, is probably an easier space. Biography is harder within that space. What's your perspective, Emma, in terms of seal press and basic books? What are you guys seeing and what are you wanting to take on these days? Yeah, I would agree with Richard. I mean, I think, you know, so Basic and Seal are, we publish exclusively nonfiction um, and are, um, you know, one thing that we have always sort of focused on is the backlist, which means, you know, that we don't just want to sell books, you know, eight weeks, 12 weeks after they go on sale, which is when most, you know, the, the vast majority of books do sell. Um, you know, but we really want books that are going to sell, you know, in two years and five years and 10 years, right? Um, you know, and I think increasingly with the way that the marketplace for books is changing, um, you know, where online is much more important, um, it's less obvious to sort of your average book reader, you know, is this a book that just came out or is this a book that came out three years ago? Um, you know, they're much more likely now to choose books that are, that are a little bit older, um, which is a challenge in a lot of ways for, for marketing publicity, but it's also a huge opportunity. Um, and I think it's a huge opportunity, especially for nonfiction and for kinds of nonfiction that are, you know, that are like biography, you know, people in, you know, 2026 who hear about Elsie Robinson are going to be able to go find this book, right? Um, and so Which I think- it feels so good, by the way, you know, this is a passion <clears throat> project of mine. We haven't gone into that really at all, but just briefly, I first learned about Elsie Robinson nearly 30 years ago, um, when my mother died, it was quite a surprise. I was going through her belongings, packing up her books and a piece, remember that onion skin paper, a piece of onion skin paper that was folded up. My mom had retyped a poem. It was about grief and loss. It was the most tough love poem I have ever read. And it just fell out of my mother's book. And I picked it up and it was like the most well-meaning, you know, slap across the face, snap out of it, um, feeling about just feel lucky that you had a mother worth missing. And it was attributed to someone named Elsie Robinson. And I had to find out who it was and who she was and what her story was and what so resonated with my mom that she had kept that poem for so many years. And I think that level of passion kind of fueled this project forward. I just was like, not going to let her go. And so I think Richard, you touched on this a little bit. Um, I have written so much about grief and loss. This is my first venture into biography. And I wonder if that made you nervous at all. And I guess even going forward, I'm putting you on the spot, we haven't really spoken about this, but um, is there a level of comfort that you have of a writer going between genres and subjects? Because that would feel kind of going back to that platform discussion I had been building up this grief platform for a long time. And then I pivoted, even though I find there to be grief threads throughout Elsie that I was really, um, it was very important to me to get those themes out 
in Listen World, I would yeah. love to talk about changing what a writer writes about and going back and forth. If that made you nervous, Richard and Emma, if that was something that Seal Press was concerned about in terms of both of these writers, Julia and I, we both had never written a biography before. So what was the concern or was there? Uh, there was a concern. I mean, uh, no question. I mean, I, I don't think nervous is or I, I, you know, because I'm, I'm here, obviously, managing a career, and and you know, and and we kind of we were in a different space, and and so that pivot and it happens is is tricky, right? And 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 you know, you can get that pivot wrong pretty easily, and and so you know, there were I had some concerns about this pivot. I think what I would say on that is that because you know you're talking about that story your passion was so um you know personal but also sincere that for me that that's a huge component because you know at some point you know i can direct you but i know that you know i'm, I'm gonna have to get behind your fire at some point and and i did right and, and obviously it, it, we had some starts and stops it took a little bit of time but because you had that enthusiasm on, you know, on quenching in that way, I, th that really was my life, right? Because, you know, we, I knew that the pivot is tricky, but if I have the passion of, the, of, of my author, then that's going to take care of a lot of uh, issues. How about you, Emma? Was that a concern that neither Julia nor I had ever done a biography before? You know, so I mean, as you know, as you sort of mentioned, I, you know, I was not the acquiring editor for this book. I came in later and, um, you know, I actually came in when the manuscript, there was a draft manuscript. And so that was the first time that I encountered this book. And at that I mean, point, you heard whispers of concern <laughs> <laughs> around the hallways. And it wasn't for me. Well, we were on Zoom, so there were no, um, there were no. Oh, that's true, right? It was a COVID book. You're right. It was a COVID book. But it was a COVID book, and so, um, you know, so, um, at, but you know, I really do believe that, like, at the time when we choose to acquire a book, you know, we're in. Um, you know, when we make that choice, like, we are, we're, we're, li I mean, we're literally invested in the book success. Um, you know, and we're also metaphorically invested, right? We, um, we all want it to work, um, you know, at the publisher. And so, you know, I think any concerns about that, which there, you know, there may well have been, certainly when I'm, when I'm looking at book proposals, um, it's something I think about a lot, like this is very different than what the author's done before. One, is their audience going to follow them? Um, and two, you know, are they going to have the chops, right? Are they going to be able to, to make this really big pivot? Um, in terms of, you know, what this new project requires in terms of research, in terms of sort of shifting the way they're writing. Um, you know, when I read the manuscript, I didn't have any concerns about that. Um, I think both because the grief, um, the grief piece was clear, right? Um, you know, how that translated over. Um, and also because what was on the page was just, was just so good. Yeah, your editing, um, by the way, your suggestions, your questions, um, at first, of course, you look at them, you're like, I cannot do this. This is a lot. Um, but every good book, and I hope this uh, lands for anyone who reads it as a good book, it's really the result of an editor's expert, e expert eye. And I feel like you really um, very delicately and just very generously um, made the book just richer and um, publicly. I want to thank you so much for that, Emma. Thank you, Allison. That's, that's really kind. I mean, I think, you know, I had, a, I had a really, really good manuscript to work with. And so I, you know, it's a pleasure to sort of be able to come in then after you've been, you know, working on it really immersed, right? For, for a, a, a decade, um, all in. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, it's a long time. Uh, yeah, you're right. It's um, yeah. it, it's yeah, kind of shocking. You look a little tired, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, let me bring back Johnny because I know that there are some questions that folks have um, that were either pre-submitted um, or maybe they're live now. But Johnny, let me have you come back on and um, get to it. Yeah, thank you. We've got a, a great engaged audience today. Um, so. Uh, to go 
back to the beginning, Allison, I think some people want to hear about the co-writing process, how Julia came on board and, and how uh, having a co-author affected the research aspect of this book. Oh, well, Julia Shears, if she could have been here today, I would have loved her to uh, share her perspective. It was just the most incredible partnership. I am based in New York, which is relevant because Julia is based in the San Francisco Bay Area. It was really important that this project have writers and researchers and boots on the ground on both parts of the country. We haven't spoken about that biography is actually really expensive um, to do as a writer. Uh, the travel involved, uh, interviews to do, archives to visit. Um, archives, by the way, aren't necessarily free. Um, if you want access and permission to reproduce documents, those are costly. And so to share that burden of the research, especially during COVID, uh, when so many archives were either closed or had limited hours, it just made um, that partnership really critical. And so I just, uh, Julia is fantastic. And um, this book is really in existence in many ways, in so many ways, important ways because of her, for sure. Uh, people are also wondering about um, a proposal. So in the in the basic sense, what should go into a proposal, a query uh, for a book like this or nonfiction in general? Um, and as some people mentioned, the research costs are a big part of this because you want to know what you have to do before you you know, get the first chunk of the advance, basically. So, yeah. so what's most important for that? Emma, I guess you're the one that's assessing the proposal. Do you want to take this one on? Sure. Yeah. So I think, you know, it depends a little bit on the, the kind of nonfiction that you're doing. Um, you know, I think that for a book like this one, um, you know, we want to get a sense for one, how is the book going to read? Um, so, you know, an overview that often then becomes something like an introduction, right? It is often expanded into an introduction, but something that's going to sort of grab my attention right away um, and explain to me sort of what is the book and, and, why do I care, right? I have a lot of submissions on my plate. Um, why am I gonna continue reading this one? Um, you know, and then I wanna know about, you know, I wanna know about the author. I wanna know sort of what's their background, you know, what drew them to this? Um, you know, why do they, why do they care about the subject? Um, and, and what makes them qualified to, to talk about it? Um, you know, sort of the, some of the platform stuff that we've said, right? Um, you know, and then it is useful to get a sense of, you know, where does this book sit alongside others sort of that are already in the marketplace. So that's comps that you sort of will hear people talk about. Um, and that's much less about, you know, sort of saying like, I think my book is going to sell like Colleen Hoover, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's much more helpful, you know, to have comps that are, you know, a little bit more, um, you know, more down to earth, I think. Um, but that, are, that also speak to the kind of reader that we're going to be ultimately going out and looking for. So when you think about your book and the person who is reading it, what other books are on their shelf, right? And so some of them might be other biographies. Some of them might be other books about strong women. Um, some of them might be, um, you know, Allison's previous books about grief. And I think to the extent that you can segment those markets, um, that is really, really helpful. Um, you know, so that we can sort of begin to imagine also the audience. Um, and then um, a table of contents. So a really good outline of sort of how chapter by chapter is the book going to play out, um, particularly for something narrative. Um, we want to know sort of what the beats are, um, you know, to get a sense for like how the book is going to move. Um, and I think that's, that's probably about it. Uh, Richard, am I missing anything? No, I think, I think that's, that's, you actually hit on everything. I mean, I think, you know, the one thing I would say, you know, comps I know are, are really important for, for you guys. And so we, we spend time with authors to make sure we're getting those, those comps right. And I think you, you said, I think for, for, you know, I, uh, you know, authors or younger authors, the tendency is to, is to go to the bestseller, right? 
Uh, this is going to be like uh, Malcolm Gladwell's, the, you know, uh, tipping point or David McCullough's John Adams is that, you, you know, you probably want to stay away from the, the mega bestsellers and find, you know, um, books that have done well that are not just being propped up by the name, you know, uh, I think that's important. So, you know, for this one, I think, Allison, I can't quite remember now, it's been a while, but I think there was that book, um, uh, was it A Woman of No Importance, right? I think was kind of a, an interesting one we might have used, which did very well, but might not be, you know, um, at the top of the bestseller list. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think it was very tempting uh, to put in those comps, for example, hidden figures, right? To me, right. that yeah. felt like, oh, of course, it's just like hidden figures. Right. Right. They didn't know, yeah, you, know, you didn't know them, but then they were, you know, these amazing people. Right. Um, and I think the struggle with that comp, just to kind of bring it real down into like specifics, is that the world that they occupied was so much more um, tangible for readers than perhaps Elsie Robinson, who was a newspaper columnist. Like the world, even showing the, um, the effects of her words and her power of her writing was more difficult, which I think we succeeded, but it was more difficult than a hidden figure's comp, if that makes sense. So I think we did spend a lot of time, thanks to you, Richard, making sure that comp section um, hit the mark. Yeah, you're right. It was, it was tough. I mean, I think because of the fact that really what we had, we, we had a lot of her story before she became, you know, Elsie Robinson. And that, you know, how you, how you, you know, bring that out was our challenge, right? And, yeah. and I, we succeeded. You guys did for sure. Yeah. All right, Johnny. A lot of people asked about the timeline. Uh, I think some are, you know, first time writers and some are wondering if things have changed in the, in the recent years. Um, we've heard a lot about remote work, paper shortages, everything else you can imagine getting in the way. So what was the timeline like for this book and, and Richard and Emma, are, are you seeing any trends in that area? Well, we started in 1967. <laughs> Go ahead, anyway, Allison or Emma. Well, I'm just going to say one real thing. At one point, we wanted a, an extension. I don't know if you remember this, Emma, but we wanted an extension and it wasn't granted. And it's because of supply chain issues. Um, there was no wiggle room. That's a very tangible um, kind of behind the curtain look at the publication of Listen World. Towards the end, Julie and I really could have benefited from a bit more time. Nothing um, that was earth shattering, just so it wasn't feeling like we had a gun to our head. You know, the end notes take a long time. We just wanted to make sure we were citing not just some things, but everything. If you look at the end notes in Listen World, um, it's almost as thick as one of the chapters. It was very important to us. We are both journalists. We wanted to make sure that every single thing was a breadcrumb for future historians and future authors. So that was critical. Um, but no, extension not granted. So Emma, over to you. Yeah. So I, um, I don't actually recall if I, I want to say that was before I was, before no, I was. No, 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 that was you. Wait, can we get Laura on the line? <laughs> well, then I really, I really blanked out. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing to immediately sort of say is that, um, you know, there are editorial decisions and then there are also publishing and business decisions. Um, and so when we um, are, when we're planning to publish a book, stuff has to get in motion really, really, really far in advance um, of, when the, of when the book comes out, which I think is often a surprise. And I think sometimes an unwelcome surprise, especially to people um, whose primary experience is in media and also people you know, who wrote a book five, five years ago or 10 years ago because you know, with supply chain issues and also with changes in the media landscape, um, things take longer now. So we are getting books into production often um, between 10 months and a year um, before we plan to publish them. And even before then, we are talking to our sales force um, who are starting to lay the groundwork. Um, we are budgeting for the book. Um, so we are, we are sort of making our predictions for how it's going to sell and, and, and sort of how that's going to um, impact the bottom line of the press, right? Um, and then, you know, we are also, um, you know, really getting, 
getting everything in motion for the book to um, to get to readers, you know, as 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 well as we can. Um, and that takes a lot of lead time. Um, you know, we try to have galleys, um, so printed sort of proofs of the book, um, at least five to six months um, before we go on sale, um, because that's how long it takes, you know, to get coverage, particularly in a lot of magazines. I mean, Allison, you you know, you know as well. Um, you know, they're really long lead times. Um, and then with some of the issues with printing, um, you know, some of the issues with um, supply chain generally, um, you know, just the, the, the logistics of getting physical books printed into bookstores has, has been taking much longer and that has sort of extended. And so, you know, what I would encourage writers who do have, who do have book contracts to, um, to do, you know, if you feel that you need more time, um, the earlier that you can, the earlier that you can, uh, that you can ask for that time, the better, because at a certain point stuff's in motion and it is really, really hard to, to, to stop that um, without harming the book in some way. Oh, we asked too late. I realize, I realize it's hard. I, you know, I do not envy your job, Allison. <laughs> <laughs> it is hard. And this does happen a lot. I mean, we're, you know, especially with, with, with books, you need extensions, but you know, there are, as, as Emma said, there are criteria there, you know, the, the, the writer wants more time, but then the, the publishing, they're slotting books and they've positioned these things way in advance, right? So, you know, if they take a book away from a season, then they're going to have to fill it somehow, right? So, you know, these are always issues. In your case, Allison, it was particularly hard because of COVID. And I mean, I know, and I don't know if you want to speak to it, but I mean, you couldn't get access to some of the places you needed to for research because they were not open. Um, and that made it very, very challenging. Yeah, I mean, we signed the contract. Tell me if I'm wrong. I think we signed it in the fall of 2019. 19, yeah. And right. so it really was a COVID baby Absolutely. and a COVID birth. And for researching a biography, um, I had to use every ounce of charm <laughs> that I had via email, text, and phone to get librarians and archivists to do favors for us to go in early, stay late, make sure they could scan documents because outsiders were not permitted through their doors. And um, this book, uh, if you look at even the acknowledgments, we spoke about the end notes being a chapter onto its own. The acknowledgments um, might strike you as extra long uh, for a book. That's intentional. Um, people really did a huge amount of work on their own time to make sure this story of Elsie Robinson was told and people had a stake in her story. And so what's really been gratifying is that on book tour so far, the book launched uh, in late September, I'm still promoting the book. Julia is too. It's been a wonderful reception. But at some of these book events in person, the people who helped us, these archivists that we're talking about, these librarians, people who work in the back of state offices have come to these book signings to, because they felt like they had a role to play. And they did. It would not have been done um, if so many... Um, rocks weren't overturned to help us find the information that we needed because so much of Elsie's story, by the way, has not been digitized. And so we could not stay home and just Google. That's really important to think about when you're embarking on a biography of someone um, who has not been in the public eye in the digital age. So much of her writing um, is not searchable and so that was very time consuming. And also, I just want to speak to that because I think it is important. One of the, you know, one of the, I think the missions in trying to, to write uh, books, you know, resurrecting people who have been forgotten, especially, you know, women or minorities, is that there's sometimes just not a lot of documentation. And it really, you know, the challenge there is, and we, you know, in some of the wonderful reviews we got that you know, they would say, well, it, it seemed thin in areas, right? Because especially in terms of getting, think about that. I mean, you know, there, there's only so much for certain people like a Lyndon Johnson, you're going to have libraries, right? To go on here, you really, it, it, it is a challenge to bring someone to life in that way. And it makes it, 
you know, even more urgent to try to find ways. And specifically here, we had I Want It Out, right? Which I, I mean, for, for the writers here, what I would do is go by, read Listen World, and we're going to make I Want It Out, uh, you know, Elsie Robinson's book, which has been out of print for many, many years. We're going to make it available for people. Go and look at how uh, Allison and Julia use that book and, and the, the segments they took for it to, to write around it, because... I'm not sure you could do this book without it. And the book, you know, uh, I want it out is, is really a great resource uh, for people in terms of how a biographer can take things and use it in, in, in a biography. Thank you. Um, Richard, what's, what's your role as an agent in terms of editing and polishing a manuscript? Um, uh, a lot more you... than to be. Uh, you know, so we don't, I mean, uh, you know, when I first started this job and, you know, more used to tell me, you know, more Jack Lowe a long time, there, there was very little um, editing, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was more, you know, working the phones and, and uh, which is sort of how maybe you picture an agent. But, you know, nowadays we do, uh, all of us, so the younger agents are now, you know, schooled in this, uh, is, is a lot of editing, um, you know, uh, really on proposals, right, is to make, to sharpen those proposals. Uh, in fact, I, I don't think there's any, there's no young agents now who don't. I mean, they have to work with authors to sharpen. Once the manuscript is, is done, I think, you know, that depends on the agent. There is still, you know, the editor is now involved, right? So, you know, there can be still that exchange, but generally now we don't want to interfere with the process, of, you know, of what the editor does. And I, I don't want to try to pretend that I'm as good as an editor, but certainly in the, the early parts of the, you know, from the phone call about wanting to do this project to getting it on the page, there, there are numerous conversations and it takes sometimes a long time to get that right. Um, and that process is important because not only because for the from the point of view of selling it, I know Emma is when I send it, she's going to want something that's going to be really polished and finished. And also I think it helps the author because they've done this work up front. It makes the writing process much easier. Mm -hmm. well, a lot of writers these days are hiring freelance developmental editors, hiring marketing and publicity people. Um, even if they're with a fairly large press, they might be doing that. Um, Emma, do you see authors uh, bringing in out outside people for certain roles like that? Um, I do. And I, you know, I think that it really, I think it can be a really good idea. I think it can be not so good idea. And it really, really depends on the particular project and, and the particular sort of freelancer involved. I mean, I think the one thing that I would suggest to any author who is interested in doing something like that um, one, you absolutely want to get, um, referrals. Um, you want to be talking to people. If you are not someone who, you know, knows other authors who have, who have done this, um, then, you know, you want to be asking the freelancers who, who you're thinking about working with, if you can talk to, to their former clients. So that's, that's one thing. Um, and also I think making sure that you are very, that both of you are very clear sort of on the scope and the division of labor, right? Because, you know, if you're at sort of a big five house um, like Hachette, you know, you will have a marketing publicity team, for example, attached to your book. You will have an editor attached to your book. Um, and so figuring out, okay, what, what is the marketer and publicist at, you know, at the house going to do? What is the outside publicist going to do? Do they have experience working with, working with in-house publicity and marketing? And similarly for, for developmental editors, you know, I think um, we certainly have, have authors who do both. Um, and it's just making sure that that expectations are really clear all around. And I think it's often helpful, you know, particularly I have more experience with the, with the publicity side. Um, if, you know, a publicist has a really defined role, an outside publicist has a really defined role or an outside marketer. So they're going to do an influencer campaign, for example, I think can often, can often be really helpful. Um, but like bringing on an outside publicist, if you're, if you're being published by a big five, you know, is probably not going to significantly change your chances of getting a review in the New York Times, for example, because like your in-house publicist is going to do that. Can I answer a question that I just see in the Q&A, Johnny? Oh, please. Um, there are two questions around, or there was one question then from Annette, and then Rachel echoed the question about 
I think that you both are referring to the blurb. So when there are endorsements, what is the process of obtaining the pre-publication reviews? I think you're calling them reviews, but I would call them blurbs. Um, we were exceptionally fortunate with the pre-publication blurbs for Listen World on the cover uh, behind me here. I don't know how I can there. <laughs> We have uh, Susan Orlean, who gave us a you know, spectacular um, review. Jill Abramson, the former executive editor of the New York Times. Uh, Debbie Applegate, a Pulitzer Prize winning historian herself. I mean, the list goes on. It was wonderful. Um, it was also challenging. My advice to any writer who is thinking about that part of the process, it's important to be a part of writer communities. I think that when you, um, when it's time to ask these favors, and it is a favor, it's time consuming. You're asking someone to read your book um, and to offer their assessment. You're not paying them. It's a time suck, you know? And I think that, um, that comes from relationship building over time. So my recommendation is to be someone who knows writers, be someone who participates in writerly events, go to events, whether online or in person and be engaged. That is how you're gonna make those types of connections where even your email will be answered when you're asking for that kind of favor. And so I think that kind of pre-work happens even well before you've signed a contract for a book. It's a part of how you live, I believe, a writerly life that is giving and receiving. Just wanted yeah. to answer that question because I saw Annette and Rachel ask it. And, and it is almost always the author's responsibility, right? Uh, I mean, the, the publisher might seek them on behalf of the author in some cases, though. So generally speaking, we, we seek them um, as the publisher. I mean, that's been my experience at, um, at, at the imprints where I've been at, at, at Hachette and, and, and at PRH previously. Um, but author, it's something, it's something that's a conversation with the author. And in general, like it is easier to get someone to answer an email from an author than from a publisher, right? I think it is harder to say no um, to, the, to the individual who is asking than to someone who is sort of asking on their behalf, right? Um, and so, you know, as editors, and I know we also draw on agents networks as well, um, you know, to sort of support each other's writers and um, you know, I draw on my connections when it comes to time to seek blurbs, but it is it is very, very, very helpful when authors are engaged in that process um, and involved in it. Yeah. Uh, well, Allison, please tell us, uh, what did you do in terms of marketing? Um, you don't have to give us a full timeline. We've only have a few minutes left, but what are some things you did months before the publication date? Um, and, and what did you do around the launch? I know you're yeah. press savvy. Yeah, um, I guess I can answer this in many ways. And in, in part, this is one of my favorite conversations because I have written books before. This is my fifth one. And none of my other books have gotten the type of reviews that this book has been fortunate to receive. And so some of it is even not my doing except for writing a different kind of book that's landing in a different way. So some of it is kind of magical. I, I, I mean, I know that sounds kind of roll your eyes and trite, but I put so much effort into the book that I'm just hoping that the reviews stemmed from the quality of what Julie and I were able to push together. That said, or pull together, I should say, that said, it's been a lot of work um, trying to find partner organizations to host Julia and me on book tour happened months before the book ever came out. Julia and I um, launched the book 
in part with the National Women's History Museum, with the New York Historical Society, with the National Press Club Journalism Institute, uh, the San Francisco Public Library, New York Public Library. We have been um, clearly not everywhere, but we have tried to cover our bases. And none of that, by the way, came to us. It was all because of our proactivity. That is so important to know. I'm hardly ever on the receiving end of opportunities. It was really us going out and saying, where are we going to be most successful? Where is Elsie going to be um, resonant? Who's going to care about her story? And finding those venues who will be eager to have their members know about Elsie Robinson and come. So that's just one example, is that even when we were doing final edits on the book, we were already thinking months and months in advance, where should we be speaking when the book comes out? Because of course, programs and programmers are planning um, very far in advance. Well, I think we'll, I think we can end there. Um... This has been so great. Uh, and by the way, yes, people always love to hear that social media is not the end all be all. So everyone's <laughs> happy to hear that there's other, other things you can do to achieve success. Uh, but Emma, Richard, and Allison, thank you so much for being here. It's so great to learn about Listen World and Elsie. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Thank you. thank you so much for having us. What an honor. And if anyone needs to contact the Authors Guild, please know you can email me at support at authorsguild.org. All right. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Bye.